Oh, I know there. I will put on the chat. You already have it, but the link for the um, page with the speakers' bios. Um, I've just added. There's of course links to this Nyan's book, but Jim Laurie's book. We just put up a note about or a link to, and then um, a friend of mine who I've always known in a Cuba context, uh, turns out was in Havana during the war and was part of the crew, the American crew that worked with the Vietnamese and rebroadcast Voice of Vietnam. So she just sent me a link to the Voice of Vietnam broadcast of the la the last day of the war. So, so uh, that link is on the uh, the resource page or the the, the blog page. Um, I, I've not listened to it all myself, but it it will take you back. It was it was broadcast in short wave all over the world uh, from Havana. <laughs> but who, which of us used okay. shortwave at that point? Um, any rate, uh, welcome. This is, this is a little bit different program. Um, it started out very uh, idiosyncratically. I've had my slides for since 75 and I've occasionally shown them, but not very often. And I thought, oh, we're doing all these other webinars. I'll can at least just put them up and, and see who might want to watch them. And then uh, it occurred to me that that was only half the story. And I knew people who had been in Saigon at the time who had the other half of the story. And so we expanded it with uh, the two other folks you'll, you'll hear today, uh, Claudia Critch, who worked for American Friends Service Committee. Uh, in Saigon and Nayan Chanda, who was a journalist for the Far Eastern Economic Review. Um, so I'm going to start out right now uh, with my own Hanoi presentation, uh, and then we'll shift to Nayan and then Claudia, and then we will open it up. Again, I'm seeing people on on here. Uh, one of the one of the people on the screen. Nina Perlmutter, you'll see, and I'll mention her when you get when we get to her picture in Hanoi. She was the other member of of the delegation that I was able to track down. So let me go to my share screen. Or let me say one other thing. I thinking about April thirtieth, um, the Vietnamese every year do something. Um, they were very clever. They ended the war the day before May Day. So they get a long holiday every year, um, which combines celebration of peace and reunification and the traditional socialist celebration of May Day. So um, we may get somebody joining us from Hanoi, but he, he wrote back to me that uh, he was going to be out in the countryside in his family's home. Um, and uh, we have uh, Feng Tian from Ho Chi Minh City may, may join us, um, but they're, they're in holiday and it's uh, 9 p.m. at night for them right now. Um, the, uh, but so for Vietnam and Vietnam, the five year anniversaries are the big ones. That's where they have the parade in Ho Chi Minh City and a lot of other cities. And the last time I went, it didn't happen this year because of COVID, the five-year anniversary there. And I don't think they're gonna do an off-year anniversary next April, but um, the 50th anniversary will of course be a big one. So if you're still kicking and wanna go, we'll be doing a trip for that. Um, the, uh, uh, and it is quite an event. Um, the last time they got very high tech and had simultaneous broadcasts from Hanoi, Da Nang and Ho Chi Minh City, uh, bouncing back and forth with fireworks and music and dance and all kinds of other 
celebratory things. I don't know what they'll do for the 50th, um, but we will see. At any rate, this is, this is uh, Hanoi 50 years ago. Um, I was with a group. I was at that point on the staff of the American Friends Service Committee. Um, I was... Uh, I was uh, part of a delegation that was organized by the Indochina Peace Campaign. And due to a transportation screw up, uh, instead of getting to Hanoi on the 28th or 29th, we were having to get from the Thai border back to Bangkok to get a flight to Vientiane. And as it happened, we were at a air base called, or airport called Udon, which was also a major military base for the U.S. as well as for civilian Thai uses. And that's what this sign relates to. Um, and there were a lot of U.S. military personnel around, and there were a lot of jets taking off. We not, did not realize it, but these were the last combat support flights going to Saigon. Um, but then we did get to Vientiane and flew into Hanoi on a plane uh, that was, I think, the International Control Commission flight. Um, and you can see still the, as we flew into the old airport, um, you can see the craters um, from the bombing, uh, though the bombing had been over for two and a half years. Um, and this was the airport at that point. Um, as we sat in the waiting room for our bags to be checked, that is to be sure we weren't bringing in any uh, materials that we shouldn't be in a you know, very wartime security mentality, um, our hosts said to us that we thought we would thought we would be interested in the fact that uh, our ambassador had left Saigon, uh, which was news to us. And yes, we were interested. Uh, the person, all, the second from the left is Nina, Nina Mohit at that point, Nine, now Nina Perlmutter. Um, and I think the Vietnamese woman is Lian and, and the Vietnamese guy is Quoc, uh, but I'm not absolutely sure so long ago. Um, Bob, uh, whose name I'm blanking. All right, so at any rate, we then leave the airport and go into Hanoi, um, where this was the, me, one of the means of keeping people informed of what was going on in the last offensive of the war. Um, you'll note the NLF flags um, this was particularly interesting because the line at the time was that the NLF had disappeared and it was all DRV. Well, the symbolism certainly hadn't disappeared in Hanoi or in Saigon too. People were very friendly. Um, and at this point, it had not been announced publicly that what had happened. Uh, this is probably at one or two o'clock in the afternoon. Uh, this is the corner near the, the big department store. Um, and that's the old trolley car. Some people who uh, traveled to Vietnam early will remember that. But then in the course of the afternoon, um, preparations were obviously being made for the some celebrate celebration. Uh, they, uh, when we got to the hotel, uh, we were told that uh, the U.S. ambassador had left Saigon, um, and or we were told that at the airport, at the hotel, we were told that their tank had they had captured the presidential palace. So the war and the Saigon government had surrendered. So the war was over. Um, and at that point, there must have been a radio broadcast, uh, but certainly there were these preparations to they 
the last minute, I think they were somewhat surprised that it happened so quickly. Um, the, uh, but it was, these are the newspapers of the final assault on Saigon. You see the, uh, Vietnam, Vietnamese are very much of a reading population. Um, I don't, I think that that like here has become less so now that every Vietnamese person has at least one cell phone. Um, if you have a Samsung phone, it probably was made in Vietnam. Um, and I just discovered the Vietnamese have a wonderful app uh, for video conferencing, video talking one-on-one -on -one, uh, that was developed in Vietnam and it's got about a hundred million subscribers worldwide. Vietnam, Hanoi at that point was still very much a bicycle city. Uh, there's Nina again. Then as we, essentially what happened was that uh, they told us about the end of the, the fact that the palace had been captured and we said, go home be with your families and they basically just turned us loose uh, and the hotel we were staying in was about a block from the Lake of the Redeemed Sword and we went there and people were beginning to come out of their homes and uh, workplaces and they just were walking around the lake. Um, it was a very uh, informal event no the you occasionally would see people who had come from a workplace there were some that's Vietnamese media there were some European media there um, but there were no U.S. journalists at the time in Hanoi Again, the NLF flag or the provisional revolutionary government flag was very present. This was the Hanoi, both Hanoi and Saigon, Ho Chi Minh City have uh, music schools and uh, they teach both Western classical and Vietnamese traditional music. And this is uh, the people from the music school uh, who joined the crowds around the lake. Um, one of the journalists asked, you see the violin under her chin in the center and the guy playing a violin. And there were several guys with two women with violins, violins all over the place as well as uh, Vietnamese traditional music. Um, one of the European journalists asked me why the Vietnamese weren't happier with the end of the war. And I was sort of puzzled and I wasn't sure what he expected, whether it was sort of VE day kind of expectations with people getting drunk in the streets and kissing everybody, but they obviously hadn't been around Vietnam enough to realize that celebration had a different feeling in, in Vietnamese culture. Um, those of you again who were early visitors will remember these, the Vietnamese version of uh, kids seats for bicycles. So one thing that was very out of character with the, this kind of low key quiet celebration was suddenly uh, some trucks um, and pounding on the hoods and horns beeping and, uh, you know, I was wondering, that seemed a little out of sorts. And what it was, was a Cuban contingent that 
had been in Vietnam, the Cubans sent teams that helped to do construction, um, may have done some other more militarily related support things. Um, but they, uh, one of the projects they were doing was the Tangloe Hotel on the outside of Hanoi. And this was the construction crew that had come in to join the celebration. That night there were fireworks, um, which were very interesting in that they did not have any explosive sound. It was only the visuals. And I have to, I mean, that's always a choice in the way you do fireworks. And I have to assume that it was because the, uh, having both the visuals of fireworks and the sound of fireworks just would have not been very happy for the Vietnamese being two and a half years after B-52 bombings. So um, the next day was uh, May Day. Uh, they say very carefully, very <laughs> cleverly timed. And so there was this pre-planned May Day celebration that was much more organized um, with state uh, participation and bands and kids and again, both flags uh, and Nina. And speeches. So it was a proper celebration in a governmental sense. And these are, this is an event two weeks later, which was a big ceremonial celebration. I just wanted to go through that to show you the, at that point, signs of war were not so obvious, but these were the personal uh, places that people would go down inside of to avoid the bombing. This is Bakmai Hospital, a portion that was hit by US bombing. Um, in another building. So you did still see some destruction at that point and along the railroad tracks. And just end with a few of the posters that. And as I say, it was May Day. So some of the posters had to do with Workers' Day things. Again, the flag and the lotus. Liberation Saigon, last minute postering. Okay, so that is my slides and thank you for the patience of watching them. Nina, do you want to say something before we go on? Okay, go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. I'd like to add a few things. First of all, it's been a long time since I've seen you, John. My name is Nina. <laughs> Nina, sorry. I've That's okay. held Nina um, in my memory for 50 years. <laughs> Nina the Pinta, the Santa Maria. So um, thank you for doing this. I guess I just wanted to add a few points. I can almost cry at, at the slides. Um, the other the guy who was with us was Bob Edwards, who just moved to, who I've just been in touch with. He's in Tucson. Um, let me add a, a few other things here. Um, we had planned to also go to the South, but we didn't know that the war was ending. <laughs> and so we ended up not doing, not being able to do that and they thought of that for our safety. If you saw anything about the end of the war from the north, folks should know that we took all those pictures for ABC gave us a camera for $500 and we got $500 and uh, everyone else was running out of the south. So uh, ABC was the only station that had anything. I guess some of my memories that I would add to to what John gave, um, I'll just add a few. I was shocked at the poverty 
and yet the positive attitude people had about their lives. You know, I remember our time more in the rural areas and I was so amazed because then we came back out, I think through Delhi or India and the, sh the difference between people being happy and joyful versus, I, I couldn't go out of the hotel in, in India because uh, it was so sad for me. Um, there was a certain sweet naivete that I remember. I remember the people thinking, the Vietnamese thinking all Americans were against the war <laughs> and, and only the government was for the war. Well, I live in Arizona where there were people who were certainly for the, for the war. And I remember that, that sweet naivety, naivete and, and the craters from the air were just astounding there. The friendliness, the openness. Um, I, I need to say that we also went by whatever the POW prison was in which was John McCain, who <laughs> I now think a little more of as an Arizonan <laughs> than I did at the time. But I, I remember having a picture somewhere of, of that. Um, and so the joy and the friendliness and the, it, it was a miracle that we were there at that time. I was there because I, I headed the um, Arizona Anti-War Center and IPC and CALC and the coalition to stop funding the war. That's how I got there. And I just wanna add that when I got home, the first people to ask me to speak were the POW families. <laughs> and I was, I was shocked and I was afraid, but that, that was very interesting anyway. So the joy, and it wasn't just a joy at the end of the war, it was a, a people who believed and appreciated their life and um, were so welcoming to us. And I don't know what else to say, but I had just never seen such poverty and yet some pr such friendliness and, and openness and kindness um, to us, even before they would know who we are. So um, I came home and bicycles, I just wanna show a little souvenir. I don't know if you noticed, all the sandals people were wearing were made out of uh, tires. <laughs> when the war ended, I ended up working for renewable energy and recycling. So I, my, you know, I love these sandals um, and I had to come home with one of these, <laughs> but it was shocking to me. They actually let me take an anti-personnel. This is a American anti-personnel bomb uh, that would have thousands of pellets in it. And um, all right, thank you. Nina or Nina, <laughs> I'm Nina. gonna have to correct 40 years of mismemories. More than um, that. But you can, we'll bring you back in later. Okay. Um, okay. So they were gonna jump south. As Nina said, we had hoped to go south, but uh, the situation didn't permit. Um, the people around us were as surprised as we were by how quickly things it changed and at the other end of the change was uh, Nayan Chanda, who was a, uh, the reporter for the Far Eastern Economic Review. He went on to edit the magazine, which sadly disappeared a while back and uh, to the great loss of, uh, of everybody who followed the region, Nayan. Oops, you just muted. If you okay. let me share my screen. It, you should be able to, but, oops, I'm sorry. Okay, all right, you should be okay now. Let's 
it's been a while since I've used uh, yeah. Zoom, so okay. go ahead. <laughs> hi, hi, everybody. Um, it was uh, this journalist luck that I got uh, hired by the Far Eastern Economic Review in 1974, June 74. I was finishing my um, research uh, PhD work in Sorbonne when the review approached me and they wanted me to go and open the first bureau of the Far Eastern Economic Review in, in Saigon. And obviously couldn't resist that. So I flew off to Paris, to Saigon. And little did I know that I would stay there to see the end of the war. So the end of the war, uh, I think you have got the um, view from Hanoi, from uh, John. From uh, Saigon, obviously it looked uh, very different. Um, Sorry. Yeah. So this was the uh, situation at the end of sort of April 1975. Saigon was surrounded by several uh, NBA division. And obviously we didn't know exactly, uh, only the military intelligence guys knew which division was where. But we knew that we were basically uh, surrounded. And from my apartment uh, on the river near the Majestic Hotel, I could see uh, every evening a uh, mortar fire coming from the other side, uh, mortar fire aimed at Saigon. And, uh, but so this was the uh, situation here. You can see the uh, Ho Chi Minh City Saigon and and this was the airport concerned that was the scene of action early on because obviously the the uh, Vietnamese forces decided the way to end it quickly would be to cut off the access to the world outside by choking off the airport but before that there were already some fighting around Saigon and I happened to be in the Mekong Delta coming back from the Delta and very close to a town called Tan An. Some several mortar landed on an ammunition dump near the road. So we kind of all hit the ground, got out of the car. And so after witnessing secondary explosions of the ammunition dump, finally we thought that was perhaps no other motor shell coming our way. So we headed back to Saigon. And Saigon um, at the airport, you had this some sort of giant US Air Force planes were uh, constantly landing and taking away people. And uh, this was um, all the way helicopters, um, which were actually all abundant at the end of the war, when I went to the airport, I was just staggered to see the number of helicopters that were left behind. And eventually Vietnamese uh, sold them off to many sort of Middle Eastern uh, clients, I'm told. Um, so this, um, um, the, actually the most uh, um, painful sight was when I went to Vung Tau, uh, near Saigon, that was the main port. And all this uh, um, South Vietnamese Navy vessels were coming from Da Nang, carrying uh, loads and loads of soldiers and their families and some civilians who are all headed for the safety of the South. Uh, little did they know there was no safety. But they were all arriving at Bung Tau port and getting uh, off the port from the, of, of the ship by tugboats. And it was really painful sight to see all these families. And uh, this was granny carried by somebody. And this is um, 
somebody who didn't make it and looks like his son standing there completely bewildered what to do. Um, and this is back in Saigon. This is near the PX American uh, PX where it was being looted. And so these kids were carrying boxes of condensed milk in the trying to carry both boxes and some were carrying some other things on their bike. And uh, so there's a kind of a looting going on and especially American uh, store. And then this was the, on the April 30th morning, the tanks, but this was the second tank. The first one I saw was here. I was sitting in the Reuters office across the park from the palace and writing a situation report. I had basically also contracted with the Reuters because they had pulled out their stuff. They didn't want to pay high insurance. And I was there um, ready to work for nothing. And so I had uh, been engaged to uh, file for Reuters as well at the Far Eastern Economic Review. And so I was sitting in the Reuters office and, and hashing out a report about reports I'm getting from the uh, Chilon area that people have begun to raise NLF flags. And I had just come back from the US embassy, which was being mobbed by people because the last helicopter had left and people had entered the embassy. And so I had also gone into the floor where the ambassador was. and. Um, the she was of course gone. And so after seeing the embassy being looted, I came back to Reuters office and was writing a report about the situation when I heard a huge sound and I looked through the open door uh, and I see a tank cross the front of the door and the back of the tank is this red flag. So I said, oh my God, so they're already here. So I kind of rushed out uh, with my camera and uh, as I was running across the park toward the tank, it suddenly occurred to me that I had a big telephoto lens and I wonder whether they would mistake that as some sort of weapon or not. So I kind of put the camera down and I waved at the soldiers and they grinned and waved back. So I said, I established my bona fide as a reporter. So then I rushed towards the tank and got some pictures. And, uh, and the tank had, basically fired a blank shot. And then uh, somebody's coming, running to trying to open the door, gate, but the tank didn't wet, it just broke through the gate and entered the palace compound. And the and this was General Big Min who was um, being escorted out of the palace and he was taken to the radio station to announce the surrender. And uh, so he told the soldiers, I have been waiting here to uh, welcome you. And so they were very brusque saying, you know, you have nothing to welcome you here. You represent a lost regime. So he was basically escorted to the radio station to announce the surrender. And this was, uh, this was uh, the men uh, surrounded by, uh, by soldiers. And there was this big bit of a firefight outside the palace. And I saw immediately the soldiers to, who are known as the Bodoi, you know, the kind of soldiers, they immediately took up position behind trees and um, they had, uh, after a 15 minutes of, of some shots exchanged, uh, obviously whoever was shooting at them stopped shooting and then they had some uh, you can see some woman came out asking the soldiers, we had now set to go. And, uh, and after that, I saw the first sign of the NLF civilian presence in the town. Um, but this is uh, also when this firefight was going on, I noticed the soldiers who had already taken a position under the big Molotov trucks um, with the guns at the ready. And this is the young kids running across the park carrying the NLF flag. So this was the first indication that I saw that they have been preparing, sewing these flags for some time. So they were ready for the day. And on April 30th morning, 
they were, you can see this kid is smiling and they're all running across the park carrying the flag. And I went up to the palace and I saw this Bodha I had carrying a bazooka had climbed up to the first floor of the palace and there was this landing where there was a round red rug with a dragon in the middle. And I have seen Nguyen Van Thieu stand in the middle of the rug and receive uh, visitors. And so the same rug was now being tested by this Bodha young man. He, was, he took off his Ho Chi Minh sandal, the sandal that you saw made of tire. He was wearing one of those. He took it off and with his bare foot, he was touching the carpet just to get the feel as to how it felt, what it was, looking red and yellow, but felt like grass. But, um, and this soldier, uh, this picture actually made the cover of my book, Brother Enemy. And so many, of, many, many other tanks, and not only tanks, but uh, long range um, cannons were brought in and, and Saigonese were so curious. They're all mobbing the soldiers, asking, brother, what does it do? How far can it fire? And uh, how do you do it? And so this was a kind of almost a, a fair with weapons on display on the streets of Saigon. And uh, there was other curiosities as well. This truck had a little cage attached to it. And this cage had two scrawny chicken. And this was the logistics, the food supply they're carrying on this cage. It is put on the front of the truck so that it can get fresh air and the chicken can stay alive despite being a lot of heat at the, in the in behind. So Saigonese were all very curious. They're all stopping to see this the Vietcong logistics of uh, carrying yeah, chicken cool. in their truck. <clears throat> the basically people's attitude was so kind of bemused. They are not afraid that this looks like kind of uh, village kids, not very educated and shy and pretty awed by all these tall buildings. They're looking around and sitting down on the pavement. So people would be going and sitting around them to chat up. And here you can see this guy is clapping. There was a sign of real jubilation in the street, which is uh, something that I hadn't expected because these people, nobody told them to clap, but they were clapping and welcoming the soldiers, not because they were, I think, comrades, but I think there is a sense of uh, a relief. The war is over and the, these people have come. Now that means that there is not going to be any more deaths. And so that was uh, very obvious in the attitude of the people there. And you can see the soldiers had a little um, tag on their pith helmet. And this, to identify the ones who should be doing civilian duty uh, in the, in the, uh, during the liberation. And so this is what's happening. The soldiers are sitting on the pavement uh, and the motorcycle traffic goes on and people stop there to chat with them, asking which province are you, do you come from? Oh, you may know my uncle and he lives there. And also it was a kind of in a, a reunion of Vietnam you can see on the streets with people chatting and discussing things about different parts of the country they come from. And this is just to remind us as to what, how the Americans saw New York Times uh, front page the next day. And this was the first a victory rally on May 7th in the presidential palace. And uh, that was a bit of different sight from what I saw in the, in the um, tanks coming in. And so this is the presidential palace. The balcony was decked with red color cover and then there is uh, flags. And the leaders, you had often hard names, never <laughs> seen them, they were all there on the balcony. And so this was, uh, this is the, nothing is more precious than independence and freedom. That's the famous Vietnam Ho Chi Minh quote up on the top. And uh, 
And this is Tanduk Thang, the president of DRD. And uh, this is Madam Bin here. And uh, this is Zone Queen Hua, Dr. Hua. She was an important figure in the NLF, Duen Van Hugh, and Duen Tidin, the famous uh, guerrilla leader in the NLF, uh, woman leader. And uh, so th th on the one side, there was the NLF leadership, other side was the state leadership and party leadership from Hanoi. And this is what uh, Lady Tho uh, truly beaming uh, the victory that she has snatched out of Kissinger. And, uh, and so the, the day after the um, parade and the celebration, I was uh, in my apartment in, and in the morning I was uh, making some breakfast when I heard a knock on my door and I went to the door, opened the door and I see a um, uniformed young Vietnamese uh, sort of Viet Cong soldier with a handgun. And so I kind of raised my hand saying, yeah. So he kind of indicated that I should move out of the way and he entered the apartment. So I didn't know what, why he wanted. Then I realized that he was actually trying to figure out uh, if any any soldiers or any agents are hiding in the apartment. So he kind of went to my sort of two room apartment um, sort of looking around and then came to the kitchen and he saw that I had some eggs and bread on the counter and he was kind of rather wistfully looking at them. So I said, would you like some eggs? And he said, yeah. So I said, okay, sit down. So I made him sit down at the table there and uh, made some omelette and toast and he was truly happy to have it. And there he is. And you can see the fork here in the plate and the gun you can see here, um, the handgun he had, he has left it on the table. And uh, I, I was trying to explain to him what I do in Vietnam. And I said, I was a Bauchi and I worked for this magazine. And, and so luckily I had a copy of the last issue of the Far Eastern Economy Review that arrived in Saigon. And the cover had pictures of, you can see perhaps here, Chu and Lai, um, Chu and Lai, Mao and Tang Xiaoping in white, black and white. And the background was a color portrait of Vladimir Lenin. So I, had, I showed him the magazine saying, this is the magazine I write for and about you. And he kind of really intently looked at the cover and he could not recognize any of these black and white figures, Dang, Mao, Chou and Lai. But suddenly his eye focused on Lenin and he was so excited. He says, Lenin, Lenin. And I said, yeah, that's right, that's Lenin. And so he was so happy to find a comrade who had a picture of Lenin in Saigon. <laughs> so he just was thrilled. And so he, thanked me profusely for receiving him and giving him breakfast and left. So that was my close encounter with the Viet Cong. Um, and then I, uh, in July, I flew to Hanoi and I had met uh, Wang Tong. He was the Central Committee member and long-time associate of Ho Chi Minh. And he was the editor of uh, Party Daily Bianzan and I had a very nice conversation with him about many aspects of the war. And I said, this is my chance. Here is a journalist. He, he is the editor-in-chief. And I said, Mr. Tung, you are a journalist and you might help another journalist. He said, what, what, what help? I said, look, I know that the CIA uh, did not evacuate its material that is lying in the CIO office in Saigon. And if you could help me get access to that, the documents that were left behind by the CIA. And he, without batting an eye, he says, oh no, oh no. I said, I said, why not? He says, look, 
The war is over. We don't want to throw salt in the American wounds. And so I was really surprised. This was barely three months after the end of the war. And he was saying, we don't want to throw salt in the wound of the Americans. And then he, to explain to me why he was doing that, he said, look, I was uh, in the Indian food. After the Indian food, fall of the Indian food to the French, to the uh, Vietnamese. I went to see uh, Bak Ho. I went to see Uncle Ho to ask how should we cover this development that will happen. And Ho Chi Minh told me that Tung, I forbid you uh, from gloating. Do not gloat over the victory. Do not, <laughs> do not hurt the French feeling because now the war is over. We need French help to rebuild the country. Hmm. So he remembered what Ho Chi Minh had told him in 1954, and he was uh, he was channeling that in 1975. And what surprised me, not only Von Tung, but other people I talked to, they seemed to kind of believe that the Americans are going to come back. Because in Saigon, passing in front of the American embassy, I saw there was no flag. All other embassies, they had the, uh, NLF flag hoisted on them, but the U.S. Embassy had no flag. So I asked, why you know, I mean, no Vietnamese flag? They said, no, 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 we have no order from Hanoi. And then one officer explained to me that maybe the Americans will come back. I said, really? He said, yeah, because Americans know that we are the cork in the bottle of Chinese expansionism. So that was how he explained Vietnam's role. And he says, Americans know that. So they would come back. And so that was in 1975. And it took just 20 years before the American embassy finally uh, was opened in, in Hanoi. So I think I'll stop here and let uh, Claudia tell her tale. Hey, so you should stop sharing. Mm -hmm. And uh... All right, good. So Nyan, thanks very much. Just technically, you were showing captions under your your screen. Did you do something to trigger that? Well, you're not. You're muted at this point. So, anyway, you. I think, no, I don't know. I didn't do anything. I think it must be some adding some setting that. Mixed. Okay. All right. Well, at any rate, it, they were weird. Yeah. <laughs> the the uh, voice translations um, were not exactly what you were saying. <laughs> so for future viewers of this, uh, this will all go on YouTube and will be there forever. Oh, no. um, as much as forever exists. Uh, the viewers, please ignore all of the captions. It was, listen to what Nyan actually said. And I hope that you use that last story. Uh, it certainly characterizes US-Vietnam relations today, uh, that Vietnam is the cork in the bottle. Um, all right, so our next speaker is Claudia Critt, who is an old friend from American Friends Service Committee days and uh, Claudia and her husband Keith were co-directors of AFSC's program in, in South Vietnam at the time the war ended. So now a, a different, an NGO perspective on the end. Claudia. Uh, is that, am I there? Yeah, you're there. Okay, great. Hello everybody. Uh, by the way, Nyan's book, Brother Enemy is full of more details, very, very good book. Um, hang on, I'm just trying to make, there. Okay, this, uh, I'm starting with this scene of uh, Quang Ai in central Vietnam, in South Vietnam, which is uh, where our program was based. Um, the American Friends Service Committee had a large civilian rehabilitation and prosthetic center here. In April of 1973, uh, my husband Keith Brinton and I went to Vietnam to be co-directors of the program. 
And Keith had also been there for three years earlier. So he had had a lot of experience with the program and in Vietnam. Uh, everyone in the program learned Vietnamese. You sort of had to in Quang Ai because very few people spoke English or French. In addition, this was uh, the rehab center. Um, and in addition to running the rehab center back then, we also, all of us did uh, reporting, staffed, uh, staffing, uh, hiring, et cetera, hosting, and often hosting visiting journalists and diplomats because, uh, especially because they like to come near, they'd like to come to where we were because we were near the site of the My Lai massacre. But today's events are about April 29th. Today's event is about April 29th, not about the history of the AFSC program. So moving down to Saigon. Under pressure from the local American officials, we fled from, we, we fled, we, we gave in under pressure from Quang Ai on March 20th, 1975. We thought there might be bombing and we weren't sure how we'd be received by the North Vietnamese who were it was very clear we're on their way. Uh, and we didn't know if we would endanger either ourselves or our staff by staying there. Turned out four days after we left, the town changed hands completely peacefully. In fact, as happened in most of the, uh, many of the cities and provinces, the local South Vietnamese administration left long before the uh, Liberation Front or North Vietnamese were even able to arrive there. It was that fast. So we were disappointed that we hadn't stayed to see it. Uh, our friend Earl Martin did stay. There was one, one American who stayed and he uh, represented us. So after we left Quang Ai and learned that it had changed hands peacefully, we decided as a team that we would not leave again. We were going to be intentional witnesses of what was going to happen uh, in Saigon. So these are the five of us who were uh, representing AFSC. Uh, that's me on the left, then Paul Quinn Judge, Julie Forsyth, Keith, and Sophie Quinn Judge. When we first got to Saigon, all we tried to do was to get back to Quang Ai. And uh, there was a sixth one, Tom Hoskins, who managed to get back as far as Da Nang and stay there. But... Um, None of us could get back to Quang Ai and it took him months to join us in Saigon. But he was put to work as a doctor in Da Nang. So every day we marked the map as a new town or province changed hands or fell as the American government called it. Uh, propaganda was widely distributed that if the North Vietnamese took power, they would arrest, torture, kill, make men cut their hair short, not allow long fingernails or nail polish, take away homes and so on. However, this is what we were doing. On April 23rd, we had a rooftop picnic, but then we realized there were a lot of helicopters in the sky, of course, I mean, we knew that. And uh, we were afraid they would come try to pick us up, think that we wanted them to help us. So we went back downstairs. President Chu had, had resigned on April 21st, and from then on, the general panic increased every day. The American government officials visited us daily to pressure us to join the evacuation out of Saigon, insisting there would be a bloodbath and we would be killed. Uh, uh, Big Min, General uh, Jung Van Big Min, was installed as president only on April 28th. I think I'm right on that. And he gave, the, he gave the order to free all political prisoners, and he formally told the U.S. government to leave the country. I like that fact that we were told to leave. As Nyan said, there was widespread looting. In this picture, where's my mouse? If you can see this motorbike right here, that's a refrigerator. <clears throat> and a driver, and then the passenger sitting facing backwards, although his arms are around the driver, so they're clearly trying to get that refrigerator home, and it's uh, also giving them a flat tire. On April 29th, after the South Vietnamese surrendered, 
uh, the soldiers all over Saigon took off their uniforms and either just dropped their rifles, helmets, identity papers in the street or looked for where they should turn them in. Vang Han Buddhist University was the center for disarming soldiers and issuing them new papers confirming that they had turned in their weapons. And these, uh, these men are half-dressed soldiers in the university courtyard. These students were, we learned afterwards, uh, very, very well organized and plentiful in helping with the uh, new government, change of government. Okay, this is us that first morning in the Jeep. This is Paul, that's Sophie, Julie, I'm down there, and our friend uh, Mantung, who is leading us around. Uh, do, 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 do. We were, we, as soon as we got there, we were given official armbands and actually put to work helping to collect guns and ammunition. These are students at tables issuing new temporary ID cards. And uh, we were actually the first to get any of these cards. Nobody seemed to pay the slightest attention to the fact that we were foreigners, four Americans and one Brit. It was just irrelevant oddly enough. The students were going out in Jeeps, collecting discarded soldier gear, taking uh, collected weapons back and locking them up in a room at the university. Everybody was uh, pitching in to help. You can see the piles behind this little boy. Uh, Students were going off in the Jeeps also to try to keep control, to try to um, help with transportation, but it was, it was a little crazy. Back again in the courtyard where we spent most of the day collecting items. Trucks with loudspeakers were telling the South Vietnamese soldiers to go to the university to turn in their weapons and to get their new papers. These same uh, trucks were used later for a lot of things, including telling the North Vietnamese soldiers to not buy the broken watches that they were being sold by the clever uh, South Vietnamese um, thieves. The first tanks rolled onto the street in front of the university where we were at about 4 p.m. This is the tank, here's the flag. Can you see this tank right there? And then a couple of us, I'm taking the picture and these are three of us, three of the teammates down here. The street was mobbed with people. The tanks could only proceed slowly. Uh, buses and trucks brought in hundreds of smiling, curious, friendly soldiers. First the tanks uh, and they were all looking around at us and we were looking at them. Somebody near me threw them a pack of cigarettes. I saw people throw flowers. People on the sidewalks were giggling and waving and the soldiers were waving back. It was like a parade. Then there were busloads of other soldiers grinning out the windows at us. And along the sidewalk came a single line of foot soldiers carrying all kinds of weapons, grenade launchers, rocket launchers, rifles, transmitters. Those ones on foot looked a little more tense and um, probably felt pretty exposed just walking on those sidewalks. So. They kept their eyes straight ahead and walked quickly. Uh, somebody on a tank actually asked Paul, the foreigner, if this was really Saigon. Uh, as Nyan said, they were looking up at the tall buildings and uh, pretty impressed. And the street kids who had always followed all of us, uh, taunting, Bamay, Bamay, American woman, American woman, immediately adapted and started calling me Russian woman, Russian woman. Uh, we were trying to get to the presidential palace and to the airport, but this was the traffic jam and we couldn't, couldn't even move. If you look in, uh, up here in this picture, you can see a, a truck full of North Vietnamese or liberation, I guess North Vietnamese soldiers right there. And they were stuck in the traffic jam too, so they couldn't get anywhere. But everyone was stayed very friendly and just chatted with whoever was nearby. 
even bikes couldn't get through. In this picture, you can see in the uh, Jeep on the left, those are the students looking kind of, you know, serious with their rifles and all. And then on the right, you can see some newly arriving soldiers in the Jeep right in front of us right here. Still traffic jam. We passed a gas station open for business. We saw a crashed airplane. The kids were already playing on it by the time we saw it. And a crashed helicopter and a crashed tank. We tried to get into the airport, but they said it wasn't safe. And this was the, this was the barricade, the, the barrier, including that television, keeping us uh, out of the airport. There, I, I don't know if the ammunition dump had blown up yet. I think it happened later. Finally, we got downtown uh, near where Nyon was and saw hundreds of soldiers and all the military vehicles uh, on the park, as you can see, and in the park. Though no doubt there were people hiding inside their houses, it sure seemed like everybody was outside. Um, just sort of a, you know, they're curious. You can see it in their faces, friendly and uh, unafraid. It helped, of course, that the war sounds were gone on this day. It had, it had been pretty noisy and scary for the last couple of days. These soldiers were walking in on foot and then the people sitting there just, <laughs> just watching the parade go by. These people were hanging out in the park. Uh, the newly arrived soldiers, as I mentioned about wristwatches, were very trusting, didn't lock their bikes, believed people, uh, the culture from either the hills or the mountains or the north was utterly different from the very um, sophisticated and corrupt um, south, to put it into one word. So this became a pretty big issue after April 29th, trying to uh, keep the newly arrived soldiers <clears throat> aware of their surroundings. So these uh, women in the helmets are North Vietnamese army soldiers. This short woman in the middle can be identified by her floppy hat as part of the National Liberation Front, as opposed to the North Vietnamese army. And of course, she's wearing the typical sandals, which were also just worn by everybody in, in the countryside. It was a little bit odd, but people those first few days would ask me what was going on, me. And I did my best to tell them. And in fact, at the beginning, I did have information because I could access Nyon, I could access the BBC, and, um, and they, they couldn't. So it was actually sort of useful, I guess. We finally arrived at the palace late in the day. This is not a picture from that day though. This is during the May 15 to 19 victory celebrations and uh, Ho Chi Minh's birthday on May 19th. And uh, Naya, there were really loud fireworks. It was, it was scary. The people up on the uh, balcony in this and in the other celebration were completely unprotected. We were fascinated that they had no, nothing, no shields, nothing in front of them. Here's some more happy people on that day. Uh, these young men are just kind of meeting each other in the park. And if you look in the background, you can see laundry hanging on a line because the uh, North Vietnamese soldiers were camping in the park and they were, they were doing their wash. These uh, three liberation soldiers we met wanted pictures with us so they could prove that they had met Americans. So uh, we took lots of, uh, lots of pictures in various configurations. These are two friends. The woman standing was extremely anti-communist. Her son was in the uh, South Vietnamese army. <clears throat> she was petrified of the new government. So she was very surprised to learn that the woman sitting down, and uh, that's a, a good friend of ours, 
who somebody she'd known for many, many years was a communist and a leader. So this sort of reunion was happening all over the country. There were loads of stories of reunions, some not so good because one or the other partner had uh, gotten married to somebody else in the interim for 20 years, long time. Um, both my language tutors turned out to be uh, part of the NLF. And one of them ended up being, she happened to be in charge of one of the seven uh, uh, arrondissements, seven uh, uh, sections of Saigon. And we spent uh, a good bit of time with her learning things, especially within the women's movement there and attending um, a sort of a meeting that she had, particularly addressing the concerns of women. Well, as everybody has agreed, the end of the fighting and the end of the war brought <clears throat> relief and calm and fun. We were just behind them in our car, I think, and happy people, <clears throat> excuse me, and meeting old friends, brothers, who knows. The presidential palace in the old days, this is an old days picture, you can see the barbed wire and uh, it was pretty well, the tall fence, it was quite well barricaded but now we could be right inside on the grounds. Um, and I don't remember when this picture is from, but obviously they had already, I guess it was one of the celebration days because they'd already installed the, um, the new flags and the picture of Ho Chi Minh. Just for fun, let me end this with a picture of Nayan, uh-huh, interviewing newly released political pr prisoner, uh, Bu, uh, Bu Chi, who's smiling. <clears throat> with our mutual friend Mantung. Nayan's the tall one on the left. Thanks for your attention and I'll turn this back to John. Back over to John. So I think if you close your share, then we'll be back on screen. Okay. Okay, now I'm gonna change it on my screen to a gallery view. So thank you very much, uh, both of you. And uh, Nina, thank you for adding in. Um, Nyan, uh, Nyan, our first night in Hanoi, um, we met with uh, uh, Wang Tung. Um, he invited us to, uh, him to reflect on everything that that meant for his whole life. Um, and the guy who then, who was, became head of the International Commission of the party uh, was with him as a young assistant editor. Um, so it, that was a sort of our most official meeting that, that first day in. So what I would like to do now is, is if people have Questions. We'll start out with direct questions. Um, you could, I think everybody is on the screen. We stayed, we're registering, we're 34 of us here right now. So if, you're, if you don't have a picture on the screen, obviously I can't tell that you want to be recognized. You'll have to send me a chat and use the direct chat to me rather than the chat to everyone. And I'll see your message, but... Uh, um, we'll open it up for questions first and then, but first questions and then more open discussion. And I figure we'll probably go, it's, a, it's about 12, 13 minutes after um, 11 now, we'll go to about 11.30. And, um, okay, anybody want to? So there's anybody who's wanting to be recognized, I'm not seeing it. But let me, I'm gonna tell one other story. We had agreed that we weren't gonna go on beyond the uh, 30th or first. Um, so I didn't show any of the slides from the two weeks that they kept us. Uh, the first thing they told us was that our whole program 
no longer existed because a lot of the people we're supposed to meet with had gone south. And so we basically became tourists for a couple of weeks. And uh, at that point, getting to Halong Bay was a two day trip. It's now a two hour trip. Um, and uh, along the way was my introduction to the fact that though the Chinese had been a primary ally, um, the Chinese were very present in Vietnamese history as a threat. Uh, as Nyan said, Vietnam was the cork in the bottle. And, and I remember this amazing um, display, big uh, mural, not a mural, it was a permanent artistic uh, monument to an area that the Vietnamese had sunk an invading Chinese Navy by planting spiked logs in the river at high tide. And then uh, the Chinese ships were caught on them at low tide and destroyed. And it seemed an odd symbol to me at that point, but because I had not recognized more than theoretically how long a uh, conflict there had been between Vietnam and China, and that it certainly was part of the current uh, then and, and very much a factor now and very much a factor. If you've not been to post-war Vietnam, um, I recommend it highly. Uh, it's closed right now because of COVID, though the Vietnamese have done amazingly well uh, on COVID and controlling it. Uh, they, one of the ways they've done it is limited the number of people that can come in. But hopefully by the summer or fall, anyway, the fall, it will reopen. Um, Lauren Gilbert just asked a question, will there be further trips? Yes, um, we're, as soon as the Vietnamese tell us we can do it, we will do a trip. We had planned one for the 45th anniversary. Um, and I don't know whether it'll be in the winter or next April, but sometime as soon as everybody's vaccinated and uh, ready to go, we will put it out in our newsletter that it's available. And, um, so anybody, um, Diane or Claudia, do you want to add anything or does anybody, I see Dave Elder who is on, um, Nina McCoy is on any, of you guys have anything you want to add to this? Uh, yes, Claudia, go ahead. Go ahead. Okay, I was I'm reading in the chat, um, and hi, Anne. I didn't remember that, but I'm wondering, instead of us writing the chat, this we could just, I don't know how to alert people, but you know, we could just uh, uh, speak about it. But in the chat, she wrote that, um, she was she stayed with us in the summer of 1974 and uh yeah one of one of our teammates uh team members was indeed killed in a plane crash it uh that was uh, richard thompson and somebody else also wondered about us handling guns uh the afsc had we were the only unarmed people in kuang Ai, i'm sure except for the mennonites we um did not have guns and didn't uh, allow guns. But on that particular day on the 29th, I don't actually remember physically picking up the guns, but I remember we stood there, we told the soldiers to come and somehow we were like a beacon. You know, these foreigners are standing there. I guess they want guns. Um, and that's kind of how that was. So, I, you know, just, just responding in aloud instead of writing it. That's it. I don't know if you saw it, but there's a very oh. different vision oh. of these last days, which one of the Kennedy uh, descendants, I forget whether it was Rory or one of the others did a, whoever's the filmmaker did a thing that showed up on PBS, which was really terrible um, about the last days of Saigon. It was- Oh, could uh, I? Can Go I ahead. respond to that, John? Sure. The, um, first of all, somebody also wondered how long we stayed. Keith and I left in July, uh, on July 4th, actually. We were the first Americans to, uh, to leave, as far as we we're told, civilians. 
and uh, others in our team stayed longer. Nyan, I'm pretty sure you stayed longer. The Ken Burns uh, documentary, those of us who were there, I'm sure we all agree that uh, Ken Burns and Lynn Novick didn't do their homework. I even had offered years before <clears throat> to be part of their, to give them some information, but they lost track of me and were apologetic after the production was completed and shown on uh, the screen. They, <laughs> my favorite ridiculous thing was that in that last episode, it said they, they assumed that the Vietnamese, that the North Vietnamese, when they came in, had put together, glued together, all the little shredded strips of thousands and thousands, thousands of documents from the U.S. Embassy, and they had sat down and pieced them together like a puzzle uh, in order to who knows what. Um, they were in English, of course, and not that many of the new government members could read English, much less imagine us even trying to put together one page. And this was thousands. And that was one of the most um, abhorrent things in my opinion about that documentary. I just think they, they dropped, they could have interviewed a lot of, a lot of I mean, 2000 French people were still there. So if they wanted somebody who wasn't Vietnamese, could have been French, could have been Nyan, could have been Italian, Tiziano Terzani was there, could have been any of us. Um, Dick Hughes, the Shoeshine Boys, and so on. So that was just disgraceful, in my opinion. And that was good compared to the Rory Kennedy film. Just uh, unbelievable. Yeah. So, uh, Skip Isaacs wrote a devastating critique of it, which I was looking for in my file. But I'll, when I find it, I'll put it on that blog page. Um, uh, so you could. And let me just, Michael had his hand raised, I'm gonna to go to him in a minute. Let me just note uh, before too many people go off that uh, on the chat, somebody mentioned the program that University of Massachusetts is doing today on the um, Pentagon Papers. Um, whoops, and Zahara just said she wasn't able to register. Uh, that may mean that they're full, but uh, try on uh, I'll put, I'll get the link, or somebody's already put the link on. I'll double check and see if I have a different link. But at any rate, the, um, uh, there'll also be on June 13th, we're doing our own Pentagon Papers program for the anniversary uh, that Dan will be part of and several other people. And also on May 15th, we're doing a, re-release of Sir No Sir and you'll you can watch it free beforehand and then there'll be a panel discussion afterwards. Um, if you're not on our mailing list by virtue of having subscribed to this program uh, we'll get you on it. Tom Gardner's just written that it's supposed to be streamed also so if you can't get on to the UMass site. Um, Michael. Yes, um, I was curious uh, because May Day is such an important holiday, like it was in 1975. Uh, I, I was wondering, do they ever pay any tribute or mention to the origins of May Day? I mean, the Haymarket uh, demonstration and the factors that gave rise to it. Uh, just wondering if they pay a uh, tribute to that and also the irony of the fact that the country from which May Day originated is also one of the few in the world that uh, largely doesn't observe it at all. Thanks. Uh, Nyan, do you have any idea? I... You got to unmute. Uh -oh. I think I didn't send this. Uh, I mean, it's a good question, Michael. I. I mean, I can uh, send you the, the link for the Vietnam USA Society and you could ask them. I suspect the answer is no, but Nyan, do you? Yeah, I, I think uh, that's right. I don't think the Vietnamese, I have never heard mention anything about the market. Uh, I think they take it as it comes from uh, Soviet Union. The May Day is a 
subsequent day in Soviet Union as a Labor Day, and it is celebrated, uh, remembered in Vietnam as a socialist country. And that is, I think, what uh, is the reason. There is somebody who asked a question about to how long the speakers stayed in Vietnam and what uh, made them leave. I was um, actually intending to stay as long as I could. They, I said that, can you, because my wife was with me until uh, almost to the end when I had to uh, force her to go back to um, leave Vietnam because my editor, he asked me to uh, leave Vietnam. He said, no story is worth your life. That's literally what he said. So if there is any danger to your life, you should leave. And so I wrote back uh, to him. I remember I actually managed to send it to a pigeon, as you know the term, is somebody actually flying to Hong Kong from Saigon carried my, hand carried my letter to the editor in which I said that I have followed Vietnam for some time and I won't want to miss the witnessing the end of the war. And so I'll stay on at my own responsibility. In other words, uh, Far Eastern Economic Review would not be responsible for paying any compensation or, or insurance uh, premiums for my stay. And so the editor was uh, clearly happy that I decided to stay. But then he said, but you cannot allow your wife to stay, so send her back. So I sent her out of Vietnam. And since the new regime came to Saigon, I had been I had pestering them so that my wife could come back. And they said, no, you are here illegally. You have an illegal visa of the old regime. And you are here by the grace of the new regime. And we are not allowing anybody else to come back at this point. So then I decided to leave end of July of 75. And so I then placed myself in Hong Kong, which is the head office of the magazine. And I covered uh, Vietnam, <laughs> Laos uh, as much as I could, as visa would be allowed the next uh, 10, 15 years from Hong Kong. Gloria, go ahead. I, I was going to add that um, people for, for all the years after that would say, well, how did you get out? The opposite of what Nyan said, <laughs> getting in was hard. How did you get out? We got out by, uh, it took a bit of paperwork and bureaucracy, but we got out on uh, an Air France flight to, um, to Laos. I think people are envisioning us climbing through caves or crossing borders illegally or something, but uh, it actually wasn't like that. Um, a friend of ours who was studying here, Vietnamese friend, actually could not get back in for a long time because as Nyan said, the visas weren't valid. We didn't have valid exit visas, entrance visas or anything else because they came from the old government. She didn't have a valid passport because it was from the old government. So that happened to a lot of people too. Eventually it got straightened out when the United States decided to recognize Vietnam uh, much, much, much later. Thanks. I'm trying to get Lloyd to unmute himself uh, to see if he has any words to add, uh, having experienced this in a different way. Lloyd. Yeah, no kidding. Yes. Uh, hi, John. And oh, thank you very much for the presentation. I, uh, I was born in Hanoi, in growing up in Hanoi. In 1975, I was 19 years old and I was uh, outside Hanoi preparing for yeah. the uh, for the uh, trip uh, to Moscow, you know, actually, I, uh, I, I, I left Vietnam quite, you know, sharply after, uh, after the uh, reunification. So uh, I was in the country during the time, uh, during the, uh, uh, April 30. And I think that uh, what I see today in a picture show by John and others, I think that reminds me about that time. 
I think that at that time, if I remember correctly, then, you know, the general mood of people is that the war is over. No more bombing, no more killing, no more fighting. So I think that uh, at that time, probably, I think that uh, for Andre people, they think more about uh, uh, about the peaceful ahead, you know, more than anything else. You know, you know, you talk about uh, the poverty at that time, you observe in the country. And, uh, you know, looking back, I think that uh, you cannot imagine how poor we were at that time. But at that time, we did not think about poverty. We we live in in a very poor condition, but I think that uh, uh, we did not think about that much, you know, we think more about the war. And uh, I, I, uh, I was not in, in the South, but uh, from the um, uh, picture in the South, I see a lot of young people, you know, they also salute uh, the uh, end of the war days. I, I know that, uh, you know, kind of hundreds, thousands of people escape the country at the same time too. And a lot of people, they, they have a hard time, you know, uh, escaping the country. But uh, at the same time, you know, as I see in the picture you show today, then there are also many people, they celebrate the end of the war. And uh, looking back, I think that is pity that we did not use the, the, uh, the, uh, the term wisely. I think that uh, if we can do it again, probably there's many other ways to do it better than what uh, had happened you know, in Vietnam after that. And so I think that, um, uh, so this is the, my uh, my feeling about that. In the North, I think that people, you know, at, the, the, at that time, just, you know, feel relief that the war was the end. And they are hoping to see their children coming back. They, you know, kind of uh, uh, soldier who served in the military service, you know, they will come back soon. Because I, I think that at that time, nearly every family in the North we have somebody in the military force. We have some young man serving in the military, in the army force. And uh, also, uh, you know, uh, I think that there are a lot of uh, North Vietnamese living in the South, you know, they, they, uh, they migrate to the South at the end of the French time. So, you know, in Vietnam, uh, for many families, they have people in both sides. Both, you know, half of them in the South, half of them in the North. And in many of the family, uh, they have a soldier in both sides, too. And I think that uh, now I know that uh, in, um, uh, yeah, there are huge, you know, community of Vietnamese living abroad, particularly in the United States. But, uh, you know, if they, they not all come from originally from the South, many of them, you know, uh, originally, uh, you know, I think that the um, ancestor, the grandmother, father used to live in the North. So what I'm saying is that the North and South is very much a kind of artificial de device, you know, so I kind of uh, among the people, and then there's uh, less so division. So I think that this is a, a, a more of a politics, you know, division than the, um, among, you know, families. So that's why you can see uh, some very uh, surprising picture that, uh, you know, the soldier in the North, you know, may have a very friendly conversation or meeting with the young people in the South and, uh, and also, John, you know, it looks like you also enjoyed quite good friendship in Hanoi at that time, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, yeah. it was amazing what, what happened when we went out into the crowd. Um, we separated uh, Nina and others, everyone went their own direction. I was pulled up into a truck that was full of Vietnamese soldiers. And of course, I spoke not a word of Vietnamese, not even my two or three courtesy words. <laughs> and they spoke no English. And I think one has to try uh, and re it's very hard to recreate the atmosphere. But I don't know how Nina felt, but I certainly felt a little uneasy, though other Americans had been in Hanoi during the war. We were by no means 
the first, uh, we had no idea how we would be received uh, on a popular level, not, we knew we'd be received well officially, the folks who hosted Americans had been doing it for years for propaganda reasons and for solidarity reasons. Um, um, but the reception of people on the street, um, we did learn both in that and later trips uh, how to explain that we weren't Russian, which was uh, <laughs> are my first conversational words in Vietnamese. Um, Hong Fai Lien So, if I recall properly. Um, and uh, that was, uh, at that point, that's who most of the people who looked like us were. Nayan, were you waving? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Uh, can I just, you know, say uh, quick words? I think that the, uh, the propaganda at that time, you know, what that, uh, the difference between uh, American politics and American people. And, uh, you know, those who fight, you know, in Vietnam are not American people. It was, uh, you know, military sent by the American politics. And we believe in that. And this is not only about American. It is the same thing about China, too. And the same thing about, you know, um, uh, French before. So uh, I think that we really believe that there are two Americans. One you know, they did not want to have a war with Vietnam. They, they did not want to come to Vietnam to kill people. And another one is the pol politics. They have their own agenda. And then they, it is their interest, you know, to uh, dominate uh, Asia and Vietnam is in the position. So I think that uh, this kind of pro propaganda, you know, uh, uh, correct or not, but uh, it has been until today. And I think that this is, something right thing. Uh, you mentioned about the hostility between Vietnam and China. This is correct. I think that no Vietnamese, just Chinese politics at all, no, at any time, at, you know, at any time we, I, I don't think that in, uh, in our very long history, there is any short period that we believe Chinese politics. No, we never, and we will never believe them. But, you know, uh, uh, Vietnamese people, we think, very differently about Chinese people. So Chinese people, they have a lot of things we need to, uh, we, we can learn from them. And they are also nice people too. And even today, I think that, uh, you know, uh, in terms of politics, many Vietnamese think that Chinese occupied Vietnamese land in the, 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 uh, the we, what we call in the Eastern Sea. You know, they call South China Sea, but we call it Eastern Sea. And uh, they, are, they are occupying our lands, you know. So, but uh, at the same time, you know, we, uh, a lot of Vietnamese, you know, seen working with the Chinese people in a friendly manner. You know, they work together side by side in many economic activity, not only in Vietnam, but also in China. And that there is quite a lot of movement between Vietnam and China. I did a study on migration and I see that for on three people. I think that uh, politics is something very remote, but when talking about the national sovereignty, then, you know, they don't trust China at all. So, yeah. and also I, I just want to, to say just short thing about uh, the May Day. I was born and I saw the May Day already. I don't know, you know, uh, why, but May Day has always been celebrated, you know, by the government and by school and you know, college and so on and so forth. And it was thought that uh, it started in Chicago, right? Yeah. No, some so more you, than... knew, you knew yeah. it started in Chicago. So yeah. that, was, that was known in Vietnam. Or did you learn it later? I learned it in Vietnam, you know, when it I was in Vietnam. Kid. Okay, that answers the question. Because <laughs> uh, Loy, I asked where he'd learned it because Loy has had a long cooperation with the Social Science Research Council in the US and also with the University of Washington. So he is by no means a stranger. So I'm gonna wanna bring this to a close, and, but I do wanna introduce Mary Ansara, who uh, is, let me unmute you. Are you in Havana or in the US, Mary? Uh, I'm in Havana. Amazing, so you got a Zoom call through 
from Havana. Mary uh, well, is you use the VPN, of course, it's possible. Right. Uh, the fact of the matter is, and this is important, Zoom, like every other telecommunications platform, could request a US license from the Office of Foreign Assets Control and Commerce. And apparently they have chosen not to. Uh -huh. Of course, the US government is apparently their largest single client. Uh -huh. just, just well, which that's, that's worth pressing on because um, this, there are other people. Anyway, Mary, before you came on, I mentioned the uh, voice of Vietnam. Uh, Mary is the person that introduced me to this history. I've put on our blog page the link that you sent me so people can go back and listen to the way the broadcast. But if you want to take a minute to recall that history, uh, and we'll wrap up after that, Mary. Well, I would love to, and thank you. And I'm sorry I had to come on late. Um, household issues intervene. Uh, the voice of Vietnam, you know, Cuba and Vietnam have always been very close. And so shortly after Radio Havana started, which was in 1963 or 65, they offered airspace to the voice of Vietnam because of course, uh, while there were broadcasts from Hanoi, both countries felt it was really important for people in this hemisphere to hear what was going on in the war. So every day at noon live, and then repeated several times throughout the day and the evening, the Voice of Vietnam broadcast news that was sent directly to Havana by Telex. Uh, and there was a team of Vietnamese uh, in Havana who received the news, translated it, brought it to the station, and then we put it out on the airwaves. And we told exactly what was happening from the Vietnam, Vietnam perspective in the North and in the South. And unfortunately, not a lot of the US anti-war movement seems to have listened to shortwave radio. Because if you had, none of the things that were so surprising and shocking would have been surprising. They still would have been shocking. But to the millions of people who did listen to shortwave radio, the bombing of Cam Cambodia was no surprise and no secret. And also, nor was it kept secret that the United States had been forced in 1973 to sign the Paris Peace Accords, though the United States government did wish to keep that secret. As far as they were concerned, they never wanted to admit that they had agreed to stop the actual fighting, though they continued the occupation. And I had the great honor of announcing those peace accords, which, which sent a shockwave around the world among all of us who were able to listen to that. It was one of the finest and proudest days of my life. And then John, did you put on a link to the announcement of the April 30th? Yes, that's what's on. What you sent me is now on our page. Right. By that time, I, I was no longer there. I had left and I was on adventures around the world. I tried to go to Vietnam and my comrades had, had suggested I go to a liberated area in the South, turn myself in and I'd find out all about it. But I didn't get a chance to do that. But April 30th, which in the United States signaled the end of the war was really the end of the US occupation because the United States had been forced to concede two years earlier. Good. So well, if anybody yeah. would like more information about that, Radio Havana, Cuba is unearthing the archives of those broadcasts and we hope to make more of them available to people. Okay. Also we'll make available today being broadcast on Vietnam television is a program about the voice of Vietnam in which I and Robert Cohen are featured. And when I get a tape of that program, I will send it to John to distribute. Okay, great. Because it'll again be the Vietnamese view of the war and of uh, the role of the voice of Vietnam. Thank you, Thank John. Thank you. Thank you. An unexpected uh, 
benefit of this program. Um, so this program will be available as soon as I can do some trimming of stuff at the beginning. Um, the program will be available on YouTube. Zahara, are you seeking recognition? No, okay, all right. There's a lot of former AFSC people on this program, not surprisingly. Doug. Oh, I've got a, just a minute, just a minute. You have to unmute yourself. There you go. Uh, actually, Doug invited me to join. I'm yes, Jim it didn't Clausen. look like Doug, so. <laughs> I'm, I'm Jim Clausen. I was one of the Mennonites who stayed through the change of governments uh, in Saigon in April 1975, and I appreciate being invited and simply uh, uh, say uh, that uh, what I hear uh, as reports from that time reflect my experience too. So uh, thank you for allowing me to, to be part of this. And I just wanted to clarify, I'm Jim Clausen, not Doug. Right, yes, well, your son, forget the name on your picture. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay. Yeah. All right, well, thank you for joining us, Jim. Um, there were Mennonites, Quakers, uh, Dick Hughes from the Shoeshine Boys Project. Who was the last of you to leave? Was Dick the last or? I think uh, actually a Japanese young man, Yoshihiro Ichikawa, uh, Earl and I and uh, Max Ediger left earlier. And then I believe he was the last one to leave. And then it took several years until American NGOs were able to reestablish offices in Vietnam. I mean, it was That's correct. It was a 20 year process, um, which pales in comparison to the 60 year process with Cuba, which we're still struggling to achieve uh, ending the embargo and uh, getting back to even where we were with Obama. Um, but that's another story and another another Zoom. Um, so thank you, unless Nayan or Claudia have some last comment. Um, I, we will say goodbye. This will be available on YouTube. You can watch it and share it with your friends. And to say that if you figure out what's going on on the UMass program at 2.45, there is a great panel on the war that Frankie Fitzgerald is part of, uh, several other very well-known people. So I'm planning on trying to do it one way or the other. So. Um, but uh, if you get the newsletter, the link is in the newsletter, but it's also been on the chat. We will put the uh, chat up on that blog page or link the blog page to the, the chat. So if you've sent messages there, they'll be visible. Um, and we'll ed edit out the stuff that's not important, but we'll, it'll be there for people. So, um, Again, thank you, everybody, and we'll hopefully see some of you on the, on May fifteenth for Sir No Sir, and and in June on June thirteenth for our program on the Pentagon Papers.